Hi, welcome to video 100. This video is going to cover Subaru engines in aircraft. I know a lot of people don't think that automotive engines are a good idea in aircraft, but this episode is going to show a bunch of successful Subaru powered aircraft. So we'll start the video off with our company RV6A. You've seen some other videos on this one here, but uh, we'll cover a few more things on it. These next four photos were taken in 2013 when I did a weight reduction program, an engine rebuild, and an intercooler improvement program as well. I also added flywheel mass to counter some of the torsional vibration issues I had at uh, low RPM, around 1000 RPM. And at the same time I ripped out the multiple heat exchangers I had and replaced them with a single ventral radiator you can see here. So as you can see from this flight sequence, the Subaru engine works just fine in this aircraft. Served me well, haven't had too many problems with it. As far as maintenance goes, it's uh, mostly just been checking compression every year, looking at the spark plugs, uh, changing the oil. Uh, the gearbox has never been apart in the 444 hours. I've never had any problems with the propeller, which is an Ivo electric in-flight adjustable the turbocharger or the cooling system. It's all been uh, really reliable. My reason for choosing the Subaru was uh, to be different. Um, I like automotive engines. I was familiar with them. I like turbocharged engines. And I just wanted to see uh, how these would perform against the typical Lycoming. It was certainly some work uh, sorting through initial issues with this, but it was all very interesting. I certainly learned a lot and uh, I have no regrets choosing the Subaru. This is Andy Simpkinson's RV9A. Power comes from an Egenfellner 2.5 liter conversion, and the aircraft first flew in uh, June 2007. Andy reports that the uh, performance is pretty similar to uh, Lycoming 320. Rate of climb is uh, approximately 1,000 to 1,500 feet per minute and uh, cruises around 150 knots at uh, 9,000 feet on six and a half gallons per hour. For the most part, Andy's just done regular maintenance like spark plug changes, uh, oil changes, valve adjustments and gearbox oil changes. At 700 hours he replaced the timing belt, pulleys and water pump and the head gaskets and he's also removed the gearbox several times to check the uh, spline shaft that uh, connects the flywheel to the gearbox. So the airplane has had the Gen 1, Gen 2 and now Gen 3 gearboxes. Gen 3 is uh, proved uh, quite reliable. So the advantages that Andy sees are lower initial cost easy starting and engine management, slightly better fuel economy in cruise, uh, much better fuel economy in climb and descent, lower maintenance costs, and much lower replacement costs. The main disadvantages being weight and resale value. Andy's really happy with the airplane and uh, doesn't plan to make any changes to it. He 
He's also got uh, some spare firewall forward parts, if necessary, so we can keep it flying for a long time. This is Jeff Seaborn's RB7, fitted with an Egenfellner six-cylinder EZ30, MT prop, and SDS ECU. At the time this video was being produced, uh, Jeff has about 400 flight hours on the uh, engine and aircraft so far. Jeff had some long delays in getting the engine from Egenfellner, and uh, quite a long time after that to get his money back for the propeller that he'd paid for. And this was a common experience with uh, many of Egenfellner's customers in this era, somewhere around 2008, 2009. Jeff did some experiments with uh, mufflers, straight pipes. You can see some straight through mufflers he tried here, but the uh, note of the engine was really ear splitting. And he eventually had to go back to the uh, Egenfellner muffler. Lost a little bit of power with that, but uh, uh, much quieter. And Jeff had a servo activated cowl flap here, as you can see. And with the big radiators, he's got no cooling problems at all. The Gen 3 gearbox has been quite reliable. He removes it about every 25 hours and greases the spline here. It's a known uh, problem point if it dries out. Jeff had a bit of an issue with number three cylinder and having low compression recently. He had the engine torn down and he's still uh, chasing that problem at this time. Overall, Jeff's been very happy with the airplane to date. He does have a new ride and he is uh, looking to sell this if anybody's interested. I have heard this airplane take off, and it just sounds awesome, really super smooth. This is Shane Getson's RV7, built by Calgary RV guru Ralph Inkster. This took a basic Egenfeller 2.5 supercharge package and replaced the Eaton supercharger with a Garrett turbocharger, making it more efficient and powerful. At 1,238 pounds empty, this certainly wasn't one of the lightest RV7s around but it was certainly one of the fastest ones I've ever seen. To Ralph Hinkster's credit, this aircraft, despite having all kinds of modifications done to it firewall forward, had almost no problems in testing and development. It just worked from day one and was always very reliable. Shane put about 170 hours on this aircraft. Didn't have any issues really. Unfortunately, a few years back, he had a landing accident with it in a strong crosswind and the aircraft was uh, heavily damaged. Ralph has bought the salvage, and uh, we may yet see this aircraft back in the air again. In my opinion, the uh, turbocharged 2.5 liter engine is the way to go. Gives uh, very high horsepower, pretty low weight, and excellent performance. I think if we had this one to do over again, we could probably shave 40 to 50 pounds off this weight. This is Dennis Glazer's RV7A. Power comes from another EZ30, which is a 3-liter, 6-cylinder engine from uh, Egenfellner. And at the time of this video, he's got about uh, 600 flight hours on it. Dennis took quite a few photos of the Egenfellner package as it came out of the crate here. I think a lot of people find this interesting. The engines were supplied as a true firewall forward with a radiator, oil cooler, all the lines, engine mount, redrive, uh, everything attached. So you just grabbed it with your engine hoist and uh, put the six bolts in through the firewall and uh, plugged in the gear leg and you were pretty much ready to go. Just a little bit of wiring to hook up. I think this aspect was really well done by Egenfellner. Um, it makes things just so easy for the uh, builder. And here you can see the oil cooler, the muffler and the gear leg in place. And Dennis did modify the muffler with twin outlets somewhat later. And here you can see the large twin radiators and the Gen 3 gearbox and the oil cooler below again. And most people did not have any cooling issues with these uh, large radiators fitted on these later engines. Dennis has had three different props on the airplane, a uh, Sincenich ground adjustable one, then an Ivo in-flight adjustable, then finally the uh, MT which he settled on now which works pretty well. Dennis has had a few issues along the way. Early on, he had a small crack near the O2 sensor, but Jan replaced the pipe. Uh, later on, he had some low compression issues, uh, took the heads off, reground the valves, that seemed to fix that. Jan had uh, disabled the variable valve timing system with some pins, which uh, didn't stay in. A lot of guys had issues like that. So you can see here, the pins lying here. Luckily, it didn't get in anywhere where it shouldn't have. 
a fix was devised for that problem and uh, incorporated and no problems since in that area. The final problem was a bearing going bad in the gearbox that was replaced back in 2013 and no issues since there. Dennis has been pretty happy with the airplane as of 2013 after getting all the little problems fixed and a lot of people comment on how smooth and powerful the aircraft sounds. With four out of the five aircraft in this first section being Eigenfellner powered, I wanted to discuss some of the other issues that people encountered with these engine packages. It was found that the spline shaft here had to be kept lubricated like this. If you uh, neglected the maintenance and left it like this, you had a lot of spline wear. And this was uh, exacerbated in some cases with a solid flywheel. A later dual mass flywheel seemed to uh, make things run a lot smoother and uh, they seemed quite successful. Another problem encountered by many users was uh, broken welds here, as you can see on the gearbox. Um, some of them break, some of them don't. Many users do oil analysis on the gearbox oil. That can detect issues like that, and also uh, bearing issues, which uh, a fair number have also had with the Gen 3 gearbox. You can see here the rollers displaced. There have also been a few issues with piston failures on the 3-liter engines when too much timing has been run or the settings are too lean. And uh, especially on the 3.6 liter engines later on, almost all of these engines had piston failures uh, despite uh, proper ECU tuning. The 3.6s just didn't seem to be up to the task to be used as aircraft engines. Uh, I don't know of any that survived that all had piston failures. Other than these issues with the 3.6, most other Subaru engines don't have any systemic problems with them. They're pretty robust and they work pretty well in aircraft. This last aircraft in the video is what I consider the most impressive automotive powered aircraft that I know of. This is Russell Sherwood's Glass Air RG. Russell is a very smart mechanical engineer and he built this aircraft with his wife Rhea, who's also a pilot and flies her own Glass Star. You'll see in the next series of photos here that Russell does very nice composite work on the intake manifold and the rest of the airplane and some other bits here. Russell had two planetary drives on this uh, engine before. He settled on the Marco M300 that you see here. He had quite a few problems with the planet gears and uh, bearings and uh, those gearboxes just were not successful with this engine. In addition to the Subaru engine, Russell has done quite a few aero mods to this aircraft because he competes with it in the Sport Aircraft Racing League. And you'll note the aircraft sports a ventral radiator. This photo shows a detail of the composite intake manifold that Russell fabricated. The stock intake manifold is too high to fit under the cowling and it weighs something like 38 pounds, which is uh, not acceptable. In this shot, you can see the coolant lines running along the belly back to the ventral radiator. And in the next three photos, you get some uh, good shots of the intake manifold and uh, gearbox details here. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Russell very much for all the uh, photos he dug up from his archives as well as taking some brand new photos uh, of this aircraft just for this video. Russell's had some bad luck along the way with this aircraft. Hurricane Ike uh, dropped a hangar door on it and seriously damaged it. Somewhat later he had uh, a brake line failure, went off the runway and uh, sustained some more damage. But he took that opportunity to put it back together better than it was before. And uh, he's got 900 flight hours on the aircraft now. And here's a great air-to-air -air view of the uh, ventral radiator setup. So what I find most impressive about Russell's accomplishment is the fact that he races this aircraft in the uh, Sport Aircraft Racing League, which are a series of cross-country races about 150 nautical miles long. So the engine's at full power for very extended periods. We often hear the comment from uh, certified aircraft engine guys that automotive engines won't take uh, any sort of beating. They won't last in airplanes. Well, we have proof positive here in Russell's aircraft that not only do they last, but they uh, easily beat aircraft engines of the same displacement time and time again. Russell has run 22 Sarl races with this aircraft, and he's undefeated in class. 
Russell regularly beats Lycoming and Continental engines with far more displacement than this 201 cubic inch Subaru. Here's just some of the hardware proving how successful this aircraft has been in sorrel racing. And it's done a record speed of 261.60 miles an hour average speed over the course. And the leftmost trophy on the wing here is the kick ass trophy. And that pretty much says it all. Russell was also kind enough to supply a couple of video clips showing the aircraft in action. And he's got uh, quite a few others on YouTube. Just type in Russell Sherwood Glass Air in YouTube and you'll find a, a series of other cool videos. And in the next video clip after this one, you'll get to hear the mighty Subaru EG33. Very cool. I hope this video shows some people who had uh, kind of a bad impression of automotive engines and aircraft. I just wanted to show that uh, they can be done successfully. They can last a long time. Not all of them do. Certainly when they're not done right, they can be a disaster. But they're not all a disaster, as some people would have you believe. And to end this video off, I just wanted to show you uh, an EG33 I was working on for my RV10 project a few years back. This was a twin turbocharged one, twin alternators, uh, Marco M300 gearbox again, like my present plane and like Russell's plane, SDS fuel injection. And this was going to uh, put out about 275 horsepower and allow the RV10 to achieve something around 190 knots at uh, say 12 to 18,000 feet. I custom fabricated everything on this, uh, intake manifold, alternator mounts, engine mounts, Unfortunately, never got to use it, uh, sold the aircraft. That's it for video number 100. Thanks very much for watching, and thanks to all the guys who supplied photos and information to make this video possible. See you next time.